Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim G.K. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of The Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of The Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Well, good morning. Welcome to another edition of The Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, our topic is The Secret Life of Marilyn Moreau. We have an author on the show, Mary Jane Pop. Her new book called Marilyn, Joe, and Me is available at Amazon and some other book outlets. But we're going to actually spend the next 20 minutes with her and talk about her book and how she came to write it. If you'd like to join in the conversation, please dial in at 347-324-3460, or you can pose a question in the chat room, or you can go ahead and email us at info, the core business show. Com. Mary Jane, welcome to the program. Hey, Tim. How's it going? I, this is a great idea for us to talk about this because the show, you know, anything that talks about Marilyn Monroe is unbelievable. I think she, she's probably more famous now than she was when she was alive. And, and I think I the reason it. people are, are still fascinated with her is simply because she died at 36 years old, Tim. You know, she, no, we'll never see her with wrinkles and gray hair. She's always going to be that beautiful woman that we saw on the big screen. Well, wow, it's amazing. Let's go back a second. Tell us about yourself and how did you get into writing? Well, it's so funny because I started doing radio and television a lot of years ago, over 30 years ago, believe it or not. And wow. in 1980, I did my first radio show. I went from television to radio, then television, radio, back and forth. And in 1980, I did a show with a man by the name of Bob Slatzer. Now, Slatzer claimed he wrote a book claimed that he had been married to Marilyn Monroe for like two and a half minutes, then got an annulment <laughs> in Mexico, and, you know, that whole nine yards. So after the show, I get this uh, call from this disembodied voice, and she says, excuse me, that guy you just had on is full of baloney. And I said, excuse me, who are you? And she said, well, I'm June DiMaggio, the niece of Joe DiMaggio, and that's not the Marilyn Monroe that I knew for some 11 years till the day of her death. So I said, okay, well, you come on the show and tell me your side of the story. So she did, and but it was brief. I mean, you, you in a half an hour or even an hour, what can you tell about knowing a person for 11 years? But we, mm-hmm. as a result of that, she and I got to be friends. And over the years, she would tell me a lot of stories about Marilyn, about her life, because she spent like 25 years in Hollywood herself. And mm-hmm. she knew the likes of Barbara Stanwyck and Gina, Jeanette McDonald and Hugh O'Brien and Carol Channing and uh, Barbara, uh, not only Barbara Stanwyck, but Ann Southern, all these, these stars that she either worked with or had as friends. And so towards the end of Barbara Klein, now Barbara Klein was June's mentor, and mm-hmm. she had she was the vocal coach to the stars, but she was also a deep, deep friend with with June. And just before she passed away, she told June, she said, you know, you really should put these stories down and write a book because otherwise these stories will be lost. After Barbara passed away, uh, I went over to her her uh, condo one day and I said, you know, Barbara was right. You need to put these stories down. I mean, God willing, you live to be 108, but still. At 108, those stories are going to be gone. And there are stories about old Hollywood and Marilyn and Joe and their relationship and your relationship with Marilyn and, and Joe. So she said, well, would you help me? Well, Tim, I got a, I got a suggestion for you and advice. Don't ever say mm-hmm. yes fast, okay? <laughs> uh, because it took seven years. Seven years. Because I was wow. doing a daily talk show. You don't you just you know, start, start something like that and then have the time to go into it full force. So every week I'd go over and I'd listen to stories and tape and take notes, etc. And as a result, we came out with Marilyn, Joe, and me. And it's June DiMaggio tells it like it was. And it's, it's a keepsake book. It has about her and her story. This is through her eyes. And we really wanted the story of the real people to come out. I'm, I'm so tired, and I know you are too. We do interviews with people that are the publicists. And it's their story about what these people are like. And I'll be honest. I, you know, I enjoyed Marilyn up on the big screen. I thought she was beautiful. I thought she was funny. 
But to say, you know, I thought she was an icon, no, until, until I heard the stories from June. Because I learned about another Marilyn that I didn't even know existed, that she was intelligent and generous to a fault. She was sensitive. And when I say intelligent, I kid you not. I mean, this woman could quote Emerson without a book. I mean, this, that, that's the kind of woman she was. She had an insatiable curiosity. She loved to read. She loved to ask questions about different uh, religions and ideas. And the saddest part of the whole thing is that we always saw her as this sex goddess and comedian. That woman so desperately wanted to be a dramatic actress, and she never got to see or to experience it. And that's the sad part of life. The other sad part of life is that she and Joe DiMaggio never fell out of love. They were only married nine months, Tim, and they got you know the divorce. But after that, I'm telling you, they still were together in heart and soul. And the day that she was buried, the day that she was buried was the day that she and Joe were supposed to be remarried, believe it or not. Isn't that sad? Wow. It's kind of amazing, this particular story, because ironically, I was in Pittsburgh a month ago for a convention, and the hotel shuttle had a shuttle to the convention. And I was trying to get to the convention. I think it was my last day there, and I was going to the convention briefly, then go to the airport. Uh-huh. Ironically, we were on the shuttle, and I was kind of irritated. Said, Why are you going all the way across the river? <laughs> the yeah, hotel yeah. is only like five blocks away. Right. And we had this interesting conversation. With this, uh, but these four senior guys were on the bus, and he was saying, talking about, you know, he was talking about Vanessa Williams, and he talked about, he said, the greatest, he w- was going to the baseball game. He said, uh-huh. the greatest baseball player of all time was Joe DiMaggio. Oh, yeah. And, and the reason oh, yeah. why, because he married Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> oh, well, that's part of it, but Joe did have a, an extremely a wonderful I, reputation. I know, but it's just, ironically, he mentioned that, Marilyn Monroe, after all these years, and he could, you know, today, he could be no more in his, in his 70s or something, 80s, but he's still touched by that generation and remember oh, yeah. what's well, going on. Well, fan clubs, oh my gosh, Tim, I mean, the fan clubs are still all over the world. They still absolutely worship this woman. And again, but she was, again, nobody understood her. They always thought of her about a sex goddess. And when I mentioned about her wanting to be a dramatic actress, she, uh, June helped her put together a, a, a scene that she went to audition at 20th Century Fox for the, you know, big mucky mucks there. And she did. And she was good. And they turned to her very quietly and said, you are an excellent dramatic actress. But we have our dramatic actresses. You're a sex goddess, and that's it. End of story. Well, she was the moneymaker for them. Why would they want to change? But Absolutely. She, but I honestly think had she lived... She would have become like like an Oprah of her time because her production company, which had been failing up to that point, was picking up again. She had just signed a few days before she died um, and a contract to do a new movie. I think she could have taken the bull by the horns and really done what she dreamed about doing, and that was being a dramatic actress. But she never lived to got to to get the chance to do it. Wow! Tell some of the stories there. Uh... That uh, is it Barbara. I can't remember our fan. Oh, Barbara Klein. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, now, Joe June DiMaggio is the niece of Joe DiMaggio, mm-hmm. and that's okay. that's who really knew her very very well. They were almost like sisters, okay. for God's sakes. And her mother and father, Tom uh, DiMaggio, who was Joe's brother, and Louise, her mother, owned DiMaggio's restaurant on Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Oh gosh, till the mid eighties. It opened, believe it or not, in 1937 when the Golden Gate Bridge opened. And they, wow. it stayed open until the mid-'80s, till they passed away, obviously. Um, but the stories were so wonderful about Marilyn just being a, a gorgeous person. But she wasn't that skinny mini that everybody thinks she was. She loved to eat lasagna. I believe one here. I got to tell you a story. When she and Joe were still dating, it was just before they got married uh, in 1954. They went to a birthday party of Tom, which was June's mother, uh, mother and father. June and uh, rather, I should say, Tom and Louise. And um, they, it was in San Francisco. Well, Marilyn ate too much lasagna. And she went to June and she said, you know what, I've got this two-way stretch girdle. Now, you're probably too young to know what those were, but I'm telling you right now, those were torture. Those were torture. And she said, this thing is killing me. I can't breathe. 
June said, take the darn thing off. You're with family. Nobody cares what you look like. Take it off. She did. And she and June, Marilyn and June, got together, the two little minxes, and they conspired to get Tom, that's June's father, who had had a few glasses of uh, Italian wine by that part. And, and she, they used to call it, he got a toot on. So he was happy. Got him to pull that girl over his trousers. And I've got a picture in the book that is so precious. It's got June's dad with Marilyn's girdle in the, mirror, in the middle and her mother on one side and Marilyn on the other, all of them laughing hysterically because June's father had Marilyn's girdle on. And this is the kind of wonderful family that Marilyn wanted to be a part of. She didn't have a family, Tim. Uh, you know, her mother was institutionalized early on. Uh, she went from foster home to foster home. It was really a, a sad life that she had. And here was this DiMaggio big family. They used to get together. They used to laugh and talk and eat and, you know, have some wine. And, and that's what she was actually looking for. And Joe, on the other hand, he really was it at the time of retirement when he met Marilyn. Because the last game that he played was in 1951, the World Series. So after that, it was Mr. Coffee commercials. They would have memorabilia get-togethers where you'd sign, you know, baseballs and pictures and stuff like that. But he was ready to retire with a good Italian girl, you know, that type of thing. Marilyn, on the other hand, was just reaching the epitome of her stardom at that time. She was going up. And it it was star-crossed. It was just doggone star-crossed at the time. And when she did the the movie, The Seven-Year Itch, that kind of was the straw that broke the camel's back because that was in New York. That was when the dress flew up on the grate, and Joe was there, and he saw it. The crowd roared, of course, and he was just Italian. He was jealous, extremely jealous. But, believe, again, I always say believe it or not, because these are things that the revelations to me. That scene that was shot in New York never made it to the big screen. It was reshot in Hollywood because her underwear was a little too sheer, and they couldn't put that up on the big screen. So it was reshot. That scene that was shot in New York never made it. So, But anyway, that was part of it. The other thing is that from Marilyn's side, Marilyn loved to talk and loved to share and loved to be a part of the family. But the DiMaggio men had a trait. When they got mad at you, they didn't yell. They just gave you the silent treatment. And that drove Marilyn crazy. She you know she was just the opposite <laughs> kind of person. So that was that was the reason they were just not they didn't get together at the right time. But he never fell out of love with her. I'm I'm telling you right now when she was um, when Arthur Miller um, put her into the Payne Whitney Institution in New York. Uh, much this of course much later after uh, Marilyn and, and Joe were divorced, and she was definitely afraid. I, okay, he thought she was having a nervous breakdown. Well, can you imagine a woman who has a mother who was institutionalized early on to be put into an institution? She probably thought, this is me. I'm becoming my mother. And mm-hmm. so she, who did she call? She calls Joe. And I mean, Joe flew up from, from Florida, and I, I, I swear it must have been without a plane. Because he just got up there, walked into that institution and said, not you have my wife here. He said, you have my ex-wife here. No, the opposite. That's what you would think he would say, right? You have my ex-wife mm-hmm. here. He didn't say that. He said, you have my wife here, and I want her out, and I want her out right now. And he still carried a lot of power in New York at that time because he was with the New York Yankees. He was an icon. And he yeah. got her out of there. She just needed a little rest, and then she was fine. That's the kind. He never he was a lot of love. On the day, on his deathbed, Tim, he told June, June said, you know, Uncle Joe, uh, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, what you try and typically say when you know somebody's dying in front of you? And he said, don't worry, I'm fine. I'm going to see my Marilyn. Now, you tell me if he ever fell out of love with her. It's just, that's just the way it was. They were just not meant to be. If they would have, if she wouldn't have been, and she was not, she did not commit suicide, Tim. I'm telling you, she was murdered. End of story. And the story wow. is in the book. We go into quite a bit of details in that, because uh, I did some research on my own, too. But the stories are, it, it, it's so sad. Uh, June was, it was hard for her to tell me these stories about Marilyn, about Joe, even about these other stars, 
because she said they all had sad lives. She said there was only one person that had a good life that she could see, and that was Jeanette McDonald. You know, she was the one who did with Nelson Eddy a lot of movies, and she was more of a singer, actress type of thing. She was the only happy one. She said everybody else had an awful life because Hollywood drained it out of you. Uh, Marilyn would come home and tell June stories about how she had a sleep with the big shots, you know, at, at the studios. And she would say, you know, yes, I'm coming over for dinner. She would come over to dinner a lot to their place, to you know, where June and, and Barbara lived, and just to get away. But she'd say, you know, I want to take a shower first. I mean, she had, you know, a robe and a few things at their apartment just so she could just relax and forget about it. Um, it it's sad, and yet she'll she'll go on forever. The stories will be told forever. The movies will come out forever. The books will come out forever. I just wanted this to be a book by someone who was there. You know, how many times books have been written by people go, oh, I did all this research. What does research mean? Anybody we know the first had experience. Thank you. Exactly. And June knew her as a, a really good friend, as a person that was a beautiful human being, not this sex goddess that they tell say all these terrible things about her that, you know, she was a drunk and she was in drugs and that she had multiple sex partners and that and those stories go on and on and on. Well that's not the, the Marilyn that June knew. This the Marilyn that she knew was a beautiful, beautiful person. And that's the story that I wanted to tell. Well, Let's take a break real quick and we'll be back in a moment. You listen to the Core Business Show. You're listening to the Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours, and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. Welcome back to The Core. Once again, here's Tim Chicane. We're back again with Mary Jane Pop. We were talking about Marilyn, Joe, and me. Mary Jane, when you talk to talking about Marilyn, I mean, it got to be up to a certain point that she had full control of her career, even I, I can't say in, in bed with the studios. But she, at that point, can really call the shots to say exactly what she's going to do, when she's going to do it, because she was that big of a star. Right? Did she ever feel that way? How do you mean feel that way? Well, uh, mean, she has all the. She really had all the control in her hand because she, even though she had a contract with the studios, she still had enough power to no, really do what no, she wanted. At a certain no, point. she really didn't. So, truly, from what I learned from June, you know, they the studios were in, in charge at that time. I think it's it's changed a lot today because a lot mm -hmm. of the stars, men and women both, produce their own films or they'll do independent films. So they have more choices. A lot of them are doing independent films these days. I talked to some recent stars, and they said this, this is the joy that they have in their life because they can pick and choose. They could, she couldn't pick and choose back then. She was, she was dubbed a sex goddess. She was dubbed a comedian. You know that little tiny voice that she had, you know, the little whispery voice? That was, that was put on. That was big screen mm -hmm. stuff. That's not her real voice. The wiggly thing that she did, that was put on. That was for the publicity hounds. That was for the big screen again. That was not her. That was not her dream. That was not what she wanted to accomplish. And that's the reason she had to do what she had to do to reach the stardom that she did. And she did. I mean, it is unbelievable. Everybody that I talk to, everybody knows who Marilyn Monroe was. Everybody knows who Joe DiMaggio was. I mean, like you said, the two are linked together forever. And and she really did not have choice. She like a, she desperately wanted to be in the movie The Brothers Karamazov. That was the one she auditioned for, and said, "I you know I want to be in that movie." Never made it because again, if they were making money from her, 
as a sex goddess and, and, you know, on the big screen. Why would they want to do anything different? They, they were making money on her. And she wouldn't have gotten any movies. They would have squeezed her out. There was still a lot of, you know, at that time with Jane Mansfield and a few others that were, you know, the sex goddesses too. But Marilyn, no one ever reached what she reached. And she was a money maker for the studios. And believe me, studios, uh, what I learned from June DiMaggio, the studios had total control. Once you gave it over, you were not getting it back as long as they were making money. Why didn't you just walk away? Oh, please. Would you walk away? Come on. She, she worked like all I'm her life to, to be a star. It. Yeah. Yeah. She worked all her life to be a star and then just walk away. I think, in part, she would have walked away when she was going to remarry Joe. I think that was the time in her life when she would have been ready to settle down a little bit. Not that she was going to walk away totally, but she was, would have been more in control. Her, her production company would have picked up. I think she was ready to do that, but she was only 36 years old. Uh, she had, had a whole life ahead of her. And so she would have done some of the things and maybe settled down. And maybe there were a lot of maybes in that whole thing. But she was really excited about getting married to Joe again. June saw her in the last day of her life. And she you know, ran up to June because she called June and asked her to make a pizza. She used to love June's cooking. And she said, make me a pizza. And June went, oh, you know, I've got a date with my boyfriend. I'm going to play tennis. Oh, please, you know, bring me a pizza. And, and June said she could never refuse her because she was just such a wonderful, warm person. So she brought mm-hmm. the pizza over, and Marilyn was all excited. You know, oh, hey, you know, did you hear? Joe and I are getting remarried on, on August the 8th. And June said, I know the family already told me. This is fine. This is good. And she says, I'm going down to uh, Mexico with Louise, that's June's mother, to buy some wrought iron furniture for our patio. I am so happy. And and she said, I'm going to do another movie. I mean, she was just all bubbly and excited. Well, now that was the Marilyn that June knew and was happy for her because she was finally, maybe, reaching the, the types of things that she wanted out of life. She wanted family. She was, She loved kids. And she wanted to learn how to be, you know, do things in the kitchen. She would always be in the kitchen with Louise and, and June, and she wanted to know everything about how to do things. She put an apron on, you know. She, this is the kind of Marilyn she was, but she was always going to be the star. Wherever she went, she was going to be the star. And there were always people ready to take advantage of that. There are some stories in there that are very sad. There's some funny ones, too, and some wonderful stories about her. But there are sad stories. You know, the stars in Hollywood, we, we think that they are just, it, it's so easy, you know, they just walked in and became a star. No, it takes a lot of work and a lot of heartache for a lot of them to be able to reach where they are. Wow. You know, she's not them to say notorious, but she's known for one of the happiest birthday songs of the century. <laughs> Even oh. the... <laughs> Have I got a what story for you have... on that? Okay, tell us a story on this one. Okay, she was very sick. She had laryngitis. She was ill. I mean, was running a temperature. But the studios basically said, you are going, and that's the end of that. You know, you're going to go, and you're going to do what you need to do. Now, as I mentioned, that Barbara Klein was the vocal coach to the stars. And th- that was June's mentor and her vocal coach. And she came over to their apartment, and Barbara coached her and said, you're not going to be able to sing that song. You can't. You you're, you look at you. You're sick. You're you're laryngitis. You've got laryngitis. And June had a recipe, and it's in the book. We've got some about like bunch of recipes at the the end of the book that June used to make, and that they used to make at Dimaggio's restaurant. And but she has a recipe for um, what a lot of opera singers use. It's a combination of red wine vinegar, water, and salt. Now I know that sounds terrible, but the Dachon thing works. It helps you to get rid of laryngitis and sore throats and that type of thing. And June kept putting that into her while Barbara was telling her, you can't sing, you're going to have to do this song, just kind of in a wispy voice, uh, sort of a sexy voice, because there's no way you're going to be able to sing it. And she did go to Washington. She did the song, which was you know became un- ultra-famous. And came back that same night. Everybody thinks that she stayed overnight and John F. Kennedy and the connections and all that. No, she came back because she was very ill. But she was required by the studio. She had to go. 
So that is the story behind that. Everybody, like I said, everybody thinks that, oh, she did that only in a sexy way for JFK. Yeah, but it was almost mandatory that she did or else she wasn't going to be able to sing. Wow. I can't imagine being the, well, I guess, <laughs> Jackie Kennedy hearing that, some lady is singing this song the way she's singing it to her husband in public. Uh, I can imagine the frowns and the, the emotional things that she was going through to hear something like that. Any, yeah. I know people talk about it, but really, was there, you know, were there any, this, not we're going to say disruption, but any bad comments in, about that? Because women are well, really vocal. Maybe maybe it was yeah, just but, something personal. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. But the thing is, they expected that of her. That okay. was Marilyn Monroe. Would you have expected her to sit, stand there and sing an operatic song? No. You know, or even a, a legitimate song. They expected her to be, you know, in that, you know, gorgeous gown that she was put into. And, and everybody thinks that, you know, she was poured into it. Well, yeah, but that was <laughs> the uh, it, it was She was a gorgeous woman. They didn't expect her to stand up there and, you know, do an or, oration. That's not the image that she had. I think she, like I said earlier, I think she wanted to do away with that after a while and wanted to be a wonderful, dramatic actress and, and to be taken legitimately and you know, responsibly. But that's not the image that she had at that time. So she had to, to fulfill what she had to do. Remember, she had a contract. And the, the, the studio basically said, you're going, this is what you do. And a story, that was it. You had to do what they had to tell you. Wow. Uh, oh, the other thing, amazing. too, I want to let you know, Go we've got like 80 photos in the book. Now, not all of them are Marilyn and Joe, but a lot of them are Marilyn and Joe. We've got a bunch of photos from the, the misfits, uh, uh, quite a few photos from the funeral, believe it or not. We got mm. those through the man who was there the next morning, right after her death, and took pictures on the ground. You know, it wasn't the same back then, Tim. For heaven's sake, it, they didn't have CSI and, and you know, DNA and all that kind of thing. And it, they didn't cordon off like they do today. So people were walking on the grounds all over the place. But, but we've got photos from that. We've got the photos from the birthday party. You know, it's a beautiful photos. And a lot of photos of, of other stars that June worked with. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful keepsake book. It's almost a coffee table-sized book, hardcover Gorgeous pictures, like I said, family recipes in the back of the book, but it's also mm -hmm. heartfelt stories from somebody who lived at that time. And I want to do something special for your listening audience. Um, sure. If, if, if they go to my website, instead of going to any of the other sources, bookstores or whatever, and go to popoff.com, that's the name of my radio show, P-O-P-P-O-F. F, two P's mm -hmm. and two F's, popoff.com. Uh, we, I will be, I'll make sure that they get an autographed copy by both June and myself. And we're going to knock off five dollars from the regular price, price of the book, and that'll cover their uh, shipping charges. So, how do you like that? Perfect. Thank you so much. And it's called Pop Off. It's my, the ra my radio show is Pop Off, and so I have a, a website called popoff.com. Perfect. Okay, last couple of things when it comes to her beginning and her end. You know, from the, her, her very beginning, you see how she evolved as a person from normal Jean. How did she get her break into Hollywood? The break, uh, I'll be honest with you, I think the break came when she did the photo shoot for Playboy. And I was on a dais with Hugh Hefner. And June, June and I, and, and Hugh Hefner, and a couple of other people that were, a matter of fact, the first, pers the person who was the assistant coroner on her autopsy, uh, in Long Beach, on the Queen Mary, and on the dais, Hugh Hefner said, had it not been for that photo on the cover of his first Playboy magazine, there would be no Playboy today, and I think that's where her break came probably more than anything else, because all of a sudden she was this gorgeous woman on this new magazine. Everybody got to know her. That started it. That was not the, you know, the end all for everything. But I think that's where it actually began for her. But she, again, that's not what she wanted, but it was an avenue. And if you had that opportunity and that chance to take, she took it. You know, if that was going to make her to Hollywood, a lot of other stars did the same thing back then. 
Well, but yeah, the, and, the thing is, we want people to know the real Marilyn and the real Joe uh-huh. and the real people that that were behind the scenes. I, I didn't want to write all the stuff that the publicity people tell you. You already know mm-hmm. that. I want you to hear stories about these people that I got to know. Wow. And her transition from a brunette to a blonde. Well, that was the time. I mean, you had all these other wonderful actresses, like I said, Jane Mansfield and a bunch of others. They they all went platinum blonde. That was the thing to do back then. But I'll tell you, she became a sensation with it. It fit her. Uh, Some of the others, eh, I don't know. I'm not going to speculate on that. But it fit Marilyn Monroe to a T when she went blonde. And she was gorgeous. <laughs> and she was not, like I said, the skinny mini that everybody thinks. She was a, mm-hmm. she was Zoftic. I've got a couple of pictures in there from uh, the Misfits where she was coming out of the water, you know, from the ocean. Mm-hmm. And she was no skinny mini, but she had a body. I um, mean, a gorgeous body. How do you think she would like to be remembered after her death? I think she would want to be remembered for... The movies, she did one movie very, very early on, and I can't remember exactly, it was like Knock on the Door or something like that. This was back in the 50s, where she played a person who was had a mental problem, and but she she was wonderful. On the, That's where really it showed that she was a good dramatic actress and that she could be a great dramatic actress. And I think that would have been something she'd want to be remembered for. The Misfits, I think, was another movie. That was the last full movie that she did. And I think that showed another dimension of Marilyn Monroe. I don't, the, the stuff in between gave her the stardom. But I think those movies, because it put her in the direction she wanted to be a dramatic actress, would be what she would be, want to be remembered for. But I also think she would like to be remembered as the person that she was. Warm and generous and loving and just a, a human being, and, and, but she was never treated that way. She was treated as a sex goddess and never had the opportunity. And But she got to do that with some friends, like June, which I, that I'm sure she was grateful for, and June was too. She's, June is so protective of her, you wouldn't believe. And she, June is, um, well, she just turned 89 in, Ju- in uh, June, and she'll, so she's in her 90th year now. And... She is so protective of Marilyn. She said, I want people to know who she really was. I want people to know who Joe was. Joe DiMaggio never gave an interview, never gave an interview to a reporter, because he always said, you know, I'm afraid they'll take it out of context, they'll misquote me. But his bottom line, his saying always was, a man without integrity is a man without worth. And he lived by that. Wow. I, gee, I wish I could talk with you forever, Tim. I, there's so many no, other things I want you. to tell you. But I've got to do another interview, but I'm just so happy to have talked with you. Same here. really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Again, if they go to popoff.com, I will be sure because of your listeners and the wonderful job that you're doing, I'll make sure they get an autographed copy. Same here. Thank you again for coming on the show, Mary. My pleasure. Anytime, Tim, you give me a call. We'll do it again. <laughs> Thank you again. Take care. Again, as you listen to Mary Jane Pop, she is an author of Marilyn, Joe, and Me. You can get the book on her website she, as well, and it's popoff.com. And if you want to download this episode, iTunes or Blog Talk Radio is available. Uh, thank you for listening. You listen to The Core Business Show. I'm Tim Chike, your host. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacque. For a free quote on equipment leasing and financing, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. And fill out the information to receive your free quote. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. Thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacque.